Your Highnesses, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to be here in Abu Dhabi tonight. Thank you very much for having me. I am Chad Crittenden, and I'm a teacher. I am a teacher at my core, and I'm also a learner at my core. So it's even more of a privilege to be here in Abu Dhabi, where such an importance is placed on education and new ideas and fresh innovation. And as an educator myself, I truly appreciate that. So thank you very much for having me. Um, as you just heard, I'm a teacher, but that's not the reason that I'm here today. I'm not well known for being a teacher. The path that brought me here was because of the fact that I was on television. Um, I wish that teachers got more recognition for what they do, and they could be on television, right? We have teacher fans, right? But there's no reality show about how great teachers are in the classroom. It would be awesome. It would be awesome. <laughs> However, I was on a reality show called Survivor. Has anybody heard of Survivor here? Raise your hand. Seen it? A smattering of applause, okay? From my friends over here as well. <laughs> so Survivor um, is a TV show in the US, and basically what it entails is two tribes, two teams that are dropped off on a tropical island. In our case, the tropical island was Vanuatu. It's a 82 island archipelago between Fiji and Australia. We're dropped off there, given nothing but a pot and a machete, and we're asked to just survive. And cameras film our every move. We're just, in a nutshell, we're competing against the other tribes, and whoever loses has to vote somebody off to choose somebody from their tribe off of the island, and then they're eliminated. Um, our particular season was men versus women. It's not like that in every season, but it was for our particular season. So it was interesting in that aspect. Um, I'm gonna go on a little bit on how everything played out in Survivor as this program goes on, but let's just quickly watch a short video to introduce you to Survivor. So that was Survivor, and um, you may not have noticed, but I was wearing shorts on the show with this. This is uh, obviously a prosthetic foot for you guys in the back. That's what it looks like. <laughs> um, I went on the TV show for the first couple days with these exact, well, they weren't these exact pants, but with the zippy type. And they did not know that I was an amputee, that I had this prosthetic foot. So I planned this with the producers of the show so that I could go on with the pant legs, with long pants, as an able-bodied person. And I wanted to see what their reactions would be once I revealed the fact that I'm other than able-bodied, that I am in, uh, in earnest a disabled person. And that is the sort of term that's used these days. But it's different abled or challenged as we prefer. But it was interesting sort of in a social experiment way to see how they reacted. I wanted to see if they would treat me differently um, before and after. So I'll tell you guys a little bit about how that all played out and uh, whether they did 
revert back to their cre preconceived notions of whether they accepted me as somebody who was just one of the tribe, as it were. But before that, I'd like to get into a little bit of background about how this happened and sort of what led me here today. Um, I was born able-bodied with both legs perfectly intact in Northern California. My big love as a kid was soccer or football, not American football, not Rosie Greer. I wasn't doing that. I'm not big enough. Um, but it was soccer, you know, just uh, football, the, the original football. And I was into soccer and all kinds of athletics as a kid. All the way through high school and in college, I graduated from UC Davis with a degree in international relations and minored in Spanish. Used the Spanish to get a bilingual teaching credential in California. There's a big need for bilingual teachers. There's a lot of Mexican immigrants. The Mexican-American community is very warm and, and giving. They really appreciate teachers there, so it was just a great environment uh, for a teacher. After my eighth year of teaching, um, I was on a mountain biking trip with my friend Alan. And we had gotten back from a particularly grueling ride. Uh, we were actually camping at the same time, too. And I took off my bike cleats and peeled off my socks, put my feet up on the picnic table there, and he looks over and he goes, dude, what is that in the bottom of your foot? Because there was like this little bump there. And I was like, I don't know. It's just something there, it's like this little cyst, because I get ganglion cysts from time to time. And he goes, you should get it checked out. There could be a tumor. I'm like, Alan, come on. You don't get a tumor on the bottom of your foot. That's cancer, you know, as if I know anything about it. I went to school. He didn't. But so I start talking about how you get melanoma of the skin and brain cancer and lung cancer, and you don't <clears throat> get cancer on the bottom of your foot. He said, whatever, man, you should get it checked out. I'm like, OK. Well, the new school year starts, and I indeed went to get it checked out of the doctor because I was on a soccer team, a, a first division team, and we had just won first division, and we were going to premier division. I wanted to get this thing removed before the new season started because I wanted to up my training. I went to the doctors. They looked at this thing. They dissuaded me from removing it, saying that there's fascia and tendons down there, and you, know, you might as well just leave it alone. But on my insistence, I said, remove it. Take this thing out, because I want to get better before the season starts. It was just bugging me, my cleats. Um, it, it just bothered me. It didn't hurt. So they removed it. No big deal. Just an outpatient thing. I got a substitute teacher for the day. So I was at home watching some horrible daytime TV show, like Jerry Springer, something like that. Bad, bad TV. And I got a phone call, and it was Dr. Ford, the guy who removed my um, growth, and he f informed me that this growth that they removed was a cancerous tumor, indeed. Um, the first thing that came to mind was, Alan, how did he know this? You know, it was strange. But the second thing that flooded into my mind was this idea that I have cancer, I'm 33, and I have a family. My daughter was one and a half. Uh, my wife had no idea at this point either. And I had no idea how to face my own mortality. Now, this was synovial sarcoma. It's a rare and deadly form of sarcoma, and the doctor told me right away that it's rare and deadly, and that um, I needed to come in right away. So I, I went in to the doctor, and he told me basically that I had two options. But the whole thing going through my mind was this idea of rare and deadly. My daughter was one and a half, like I said, and that was what really profoundly drove me to see the other side of this situation. Um, I knew that I was going to live at that point. I was not going to let the statistics sort of rule that. Um, I knew that I would one day walk her down the aisle. I knew that I would be able to teach her how to, to be a good person. And that was what really, really stayed in me. And I saw this happening in my life, sort of this, this path of what was going to happen. And that really, really drove me to just know that, that things were going to be OK. It's kind of hard to explain, but it's a positive thinking, but even more sort of deep than that. Um, when I went and Googled synovial sarcoma after I left and after I told my wife the news, I just wanted to research what it was. I found this website, uh, it was a medical research site, and it had 
synovial sarcoma and some sort of a graph. And on one axis, it had time, and the other axis was deaths. And it was straight up. It was like, within 18 months, most people will have this cancer metastasized to the lungs, and then it's pretty much over. Um, I sort of wanted to ignore that, and I did. I just put Apple quit. I was like, out of there. You know? Apple Q, don't want to see it. So I chose not to dwell on the mortality aspect, but instead got practical about what I was going to do about the situation. I was given two options. I could have most of the foot removed where the tumor was. There's a margin around where the tumor is, although that would leave me with a partial foot, um, a permanent limp, and I wouldn't be able to run again. Now, one of the first things in my mind, too, was after this mortality thing was I'm not going to be able to play soccer again. I'm right-footed. I'll never be able to strike the ball like that again. And so these, th these are sort of selfish thoughts about not being able to play soccer again. But on top of that, I just felt like I don't know what my life was going to be like as an athlete again. But once I started to research online and figure out whether I was going to do this wide excision or the amputation was the second option. And it's what I just called the unspeakable. But I had to practically look through and figure out my situation and what I was going to do. I went online and I found amazing things, that pe what people were doing all over the world with these crazy looking carbon fiber and titanium feet. They were running, they were playing soccer, they were doing triathlon, they were climbing mountains, they were snowboarding. It was just amazing things. And I truly got inspiration from seeing what disabled folks were doing there. And I kind of took, internalized that, that sort of inspiration and it made my decision pretty easy to have the foot removed. So I had that surgery. It wasn't easy, but the hardest part was just kind of being cooped up at home for six months and, and just having the patience and finding that patience in myself and that sort of optimism to, to kind of get through that period. And like I say, it was hard, but it was just really a matter of patience, and that's what got me through that period. Six months after I got my permanent prosthesis, and I set a goal for myself to just get back on the horse and get back into athletics. And so nine months after the surgery, I did a triathlon. I just went for it. I went to my prosthetist, the guy that makes legs, I said, I want a swim foot and a bike foot and a running foot, and we just did it. And so after nine months, finished the triathlon. After that, it basically proved to myself that I could do this stuff again that I could get back into athletics. And I was feeling confident that, that things were gonna go well. Now the entire time I was getting CT scans in my lungs, bone scans, to see if it would metastasize. And thank God it was not coming back. So this was, was good news. Um, shortly after sort of proving to myself that I could do this athletic stuff, my wife and I sat down to watch um, season eight of Survivor. And I had never sent in a tape or tried to apply to the show. I always thought that it would be cool to be on the show. However, um, I remember mentioning it one time, and uh, it was a time when um, my wife was pregnant, and we were watching the first season. I said, I'd like to go on this new show, Survivor. So she looks over, and um, she's like, how long would you be gone? And I said, I don't know, like six weeks, eight weeks or something. And she was like, out to here. She goes, you would leave me with the baby? And she started like the Hydra, you know, like going after with the hormones and everything. And it's like, no, I'm not going anywhere. Nope, nope, I'm sorry. Uh, that's, that's the end of that one. But now, for, fast forward to where we are now, where I just lost my foot and did the triathlon. And, and the next season of Survivor comes on and I said, uh, or the, the announcer says, if you'd like to be the next contestant on Survivor, you know, send in your tape. And that's when it sort of lined up. I mean, literally and figuratively there, I was sitting on the couch, my foot up, and then it just sort of lined all the way up to where the TV was. And I saw that if I sent in my tape now, that I would get onto the show. And it was one of these same sort of visions that I knew was going to happen, and it, and it did. So I made it onto Survivor. Um, sort of full, full circle, back around, Un unzip the pant legs. So here we are back to where this idea of preconceived notions comes into play. Now, did, did the rest of the tribe that I was with, did they judge me for being someone who's disabled, or did, you know, did they accept me now for, for what they saw I was able to do? 
And it was interesting, because they saw the same stuff that you guys just saw me do. Um, so I wanted to kind of see how that worked out. And for the most part, they were good with it. They were very supportive, and they were saying words like inspiration and stuff. However, there was a camera on them, so I knew I had to take these reactions with a grain of salt. So if, if somebody's thinking, oh great, we got the disabled guy on our team, what are we gonna do now? You know, they're not gonna say that. Mom's watching on the other end, right? They're, that's a little callous. So there, I knew that I had to watch um, and, and, and gauge what they were saying and, um, based on their, um, their reactions, I mean their, their actions, that is. So after several days, I realized that they were good with it. There was one exception, one guy did revert back to his preconceived notions and wanted to get me voted, voted off because of this and told the other guys, Chad's the weakest link, get him out of there. We already had an alliance and we voted him off of there, so he was out of there. Um, but as the show went on, it was interesting, men versus women. The women were dominating the men and the physical challenges, the mental challenges. We were getting voted off left and right. Um, it got down to the point where there were three men and six women, and we merged together into one tribe where we were all going individually. Um, they joked um, at one point, we became very good friends, um, or some of us did, <laughs> um, on, the, on the tribe. And um, at one point, we won a mask and a snorkel. So you have to find your own food, you have to find your, everything is, is at, uh, it, it's at your disposal in, in nature, but they do not uh, provide anything to you. So we went out on the coral reef and were sort of looking for crustaceans and fish, but we had discovered recently that there were sea snakes in the coral. This little I had actually discovered that there were uh, these black and white striped snakes with the sort of fishy tails. I know them as sea snakes, very deadly snake. So we didn't go on the coral anymore after that. Um, but I did, I would go out there and, and there's one place where you would have to hold your breath and then go down after these deep fish. Now we didn't have a snorkel, so you had to sort of stand on this coral, but I had the advantage, they said, because I would stand on the coral like this. You know, so if the fish wanted to bite this titanium and carbon fiber, they could all day long, you know, and then bend their little teeth on it, it's okay, you know. But I could balance in the water this way, it's hard. But, um, but so they said I had an advantage, and so I took it one step further, and you know, when we would go into the forays in the jungle for, for food, um, I would be the leader of the line of people because there were snakes there as well. And so I said, I only have a 50% chance of the good leg getting bit, you know. So, you know, it was all right. And I was like, I could make it 100% if I flush them out, you know, like this. And I just rid of the snakes. Um, as the game went on, we were voted off as guys. Our tribe basically um, was dominated by the women. Two men voted off. Myself and Sarge, there was one guy left named Chris. Chris manipulated the women to vote each other off, and Chris won the million dollars, so that's how it ended. <laughs> I don't think I could have done that. He's very um, clever in the way that he was telling them different things, and I don't know if I was capable of that, but he's a good friend, and so congrats to him. After Survivor, um, I was somehow um, the de facto um, amputee spokesman or disabled spokesperson because 20 million people were watching this show every week. And so I was happy to embrace that role as somebody who is an amputee advocate now. And I still enjoy that role and I feel like that was my sort of thing that I was meant to do in life. Um, I worked with the Challenge Athletes Foundation. We help um, to fit athletic prostheses and give athletic equipment to those that are less fortunate, um, that are disabled, that can't afford it. Uh, I work with Adaptive Action Sports. It's a group started by Amy Purdy, who is supposed to be here tonight. She's a wonderful friend. And she started a similar group to give sporting equipment to those in need that want to do extreme sports. So we're talking snowboarding, uh, mountain biking, climbing, those sorts of things in the X Games. This is what she does. And so these organizations have been just wonderful, and I feel like it's a privilege now to be in this role as a teacher in another way. So it's just been um, a blessing, and, and I'm, I've truly enjoyed what I've done. 
I've accomplished some other things athletically. Um, you're going to see that in a little bit. Um, most notable, the, the last uh, sort of large accomplishment was the New York City Marathon. Never done a marathon before. It was awesome. It's awesome. And um, the training isn't so awesome. <laughs> I don't think I'll do another one. It was long and boring training. There's probably marathoners out there going, no, it's great. But yeah, I think I'll stick to middle distance stuff. Um, but I will be climbing Mount Kilimanjaro this summer as part of the Challenge Athletes Foundation. We're raising money and awareness for the CAF. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, thank you. So I'd like you guys to take a look at another video here, which demonstrates some of the things I've just been talking about. So let's check it out. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, it makes me cringe a little bit sometimes when I'm watching that because I don't want this to be all about this is the Chad show and look how great I am and woo -hoo. It's really just to demonstrate what people with disabilities are capable of. So I'm really just representing a group of people that are capable of so much. And I am there with other disabled 
challenged athletes that are doing the same thing. I was competing against some of them in some of those things that you saw. Some of them I won, some of them I didn't. Um, but my role as an amputee advocate is what I really cherish now. And visiting new amputees in the hospital, that's what I really love to do. And whatever positive stuff that I have, whatever optimism that I have, where it came from, I'm not exactly sure. I think it was a loving household. I think it was being brought up with lots of love and encouragement. And that's where I trace it back. But whatever that is, I like to pass it on to those in the hospital. There was somebody that visited me, an amputee, that visited me right after my surgery, like the first day. He came in, uh, my wife arranged it. He came, he just walked in and sat down, introduced himself, took off his leg, showed me all the stuff, put it back on, told me all about it, it's no big deal. He walked out. And I remember him walking out of that room, and I just, it flipped a switch. I was like, there's no reason I can't do that now. So that's what I really love to do, is visit amputees in the hospital. I'm, I have a few right now that I'm helping out. But that part is, is great. I love doing that. The second sort of component of what I'm doing now, and what I really enjoy doing, is helping amputees look better, you know? There's this post that I have under here, um, it, it works well, it's very functional. And when I'm out in public, everyone knows that I'm an amputee. And when my kids are there and they, um, other kids are sort of pointing and saying, you know, your dad, what's the matter with him and stuff? They say, well, he was on Survivor. And they're like, oh, okay, you know, so they have that to say. They can, you know, they can cash that one in. But not all amputees or others with disabilities have that, lo that um, luxury to be able to say that. Um, so I'm working with a company now that we're making these amazing prosthetic fairings. It just attaches right on. And it's based on a scan of your exact morphology, your exact mirror image of your sound side leg. So it's really neat. We're able to make things. This would actually match my outfit a little better, this brown. But this is flashy. Um, so. Um, it's just kind of a cool thing to be involved with now and making and helping amputees feel better about how they look. So that's, uh, that's something that I feel sort of privileged to be a part of. And it seems it's, it's called 3D printing. It's a new technology and it seems fitting and it's, there's a parallel now being in Abu Dhabi because from what I've learned and what I'm excited to learn more about is just this idea that there's fresh new ideas and research and technology and education and helping others. And, and it's just such an exciting place to be. So thank you so much for having me. I am going to leave you guys with um, a last little video about this stuff and uh, the future of prosthetics. So check this out. It's very difficult to predict where the future of prosthetics is going. But with 3D printing technology, we're now able to help people who have lost their limbs by using computer-assisted design to create innovative new legs. Today, it's very expensive to print a 3D leg, but with new innovations, it will become a very affordable option, especially for people in war-torn countries, in areas where landmines have taken legs. Our goal is to help amputees return to a high level of productivity and self-confidence, leading to their happiness and well-being. I said I was going to leave you with that, but I actually want to leave you with my favorite quote, and that is something that inspired me before I even had surgery or went through cancer. It's been almost 10 years now. Thank God it hasn't come back. Um, and this inspiring quote I'm going to share with you now, and it goes like this. People are always blaming their circumstances on who they are. I don't believe in circumstances. The people that get on in this world are the people that get up 
and look for the circumstances they want. And if they can't find them, they make them. Thank you guys for having me. <laughs>